Lord Jesus, thank you so much that we can be here this Sabbath morning. We pray that you will be with us, Lord, that your Holy Spirit would speak to our hearts, God, and that after this, we would know how to be prepared to give an answer. We love you so much. Thank you for being here. Amen. How can I understand unless someone guides me? Well, this isn't the first time this question has been asked, nor will it be the last, right? People ask it all the time, even like mentioned before with math homework. I mean, I, I'm kind of still asking that, but fortunately, since I'm Theo, I don't have to take math classes, amen. <laughs> <laughs> but people ask this question all the time because people have questions, right? People want answers. But I'm wondering if in Acts chapter eight, the Ethiopian eunuch, the little skit we just did here, if there's something we can learn about him, about the asker of the question, that can maybe guide us into understanding how to best give an answer and what goes into that, what is entailed. Turn with me in your Bibles to Acts chapter eight, starting at verse 26. A lot of you probably know this story, but you know, you can still turn if you would like to. So what can we learn about the eunuch? Well, it says that he was head of the treasury of Ethiopia. So obviously we're looking at someone with power, with influence, right? Head of the state, a government official, right? He, he carries authority, right? He comes with an entourage. He has a secretary who organizes his stuff. He has representatives, he has an agent. He's big time. He's a powerful man, an authoritative man. So that's something we know about him so far. But there's another clue that gives us a little more insight. He was coming down from Jerusalem from worshiping. Now, Jerusalem is about 1,500 miles away from Ethiopia. So I don't know about you, that doesn't sound like he casually went there this trip would have probably taken at least a month, maybe a month and a half, to get all that way in a chariot, right? So if he's going to Jerusalem and it takes a month to get there and back, this obviously shows that it, it's important to him, right? He went to go worship there, to take all that effort, to leave the state in the hands of somebody else. So obviously this is important. And as he was coming back, he was reading from the prophet Isaiah. He had a scroll. He had a scroll. He bought a scroll. That's not the same as buying a, a pocket Bible, right? He had money. And he was reading it devoutly, seeking to understand. How can I understand unless someone guides me? I don't know about you, but a government official admitting help from a random stranger means that he had probably exhausted his mental capacity. Capacity. He'd exhausted it. How can I understand unless someone guides me? It's possible that he was a proselyte, a convert to Judaism. This means that whenever he was at the temple in Jerusalem, um, you know, obviously he would have been very interested, but he would have been hindered from going in, not because he was a convert and outside, but because of his eunuch status. He would have maybe had to sit in the outside of the temple, the outer courts, out in the foyer, and listen. He could not come into the inner, the inner temple, and hear the teachings. So he went all this way, a month and a half, to hear echoes. And then as he's leaving, he's reading, seeking to understand. He is pious, he is devout, but he's also searching for an answer. I feel like he represents a lot of different people, right? He's rich, he's powerful, he's got it all, but he's also searching. So we can see that searching isn't, isn't dependent on one's status in society. Searching is something we all do. It's something we all experience. But how do we find an answer? How are we supposed to provide the answer? What are we to do? Well, there's another thing about this eunuch I think is kind of interesting. 
Like I mentioned before about him being a eunuch, he couldn't come into the inner temple. But there's more to that. (laughs) He probably also was despised, maybe marginalized because of his status. Maybe not openly all the time, maybe, but maybe given a little like, yeah, yeah, I know, right? Like That kind of deal. So him reading Isaiah 53, which describes the sufferings of Christ, it is possible he resonated with it quite a lot. To the point of where later down, after Philip joins him in the chariot, he asks him, who is the author talking about? Is he talking about himself or somebody else? It sounds like in there is embedded, how does the Bible apply to me? How can I relate to this person? Is there someone who I can relate to? I felt this way before. It doesn't directly state that, but I, I feel like it would be hard to read Isaiah 53 if you'd experience something similar and not resonate with who it's talking about. So he's asking, who is the author speaking about? How can I understand unless someone guides me? These are the questions the world is asking. But how are we to be prepared to give an answer? It's coming, I'm gonna, I'm gonna explain it later, don't worry. How are we to be prepared to give an answer? Well, like I mentioned before, this is the state of our world. Look around you, everywhere, chaos. People looking for answers. People who see the Bible covered in dust on their desk and say, I just don't understand what's going on. How, some of the big questions are, how can a loving God allow suffering, right? Why did this happen to me? People are asking big questions. How can I believe the Bible? And this kind of puts us in an awkward position because not all of us are scholars. Not all of us are historians. Not all of us are scientists. So how are we going to answer those questions? How are we going to be prepared to give an answer? What happens in the process of that? When someone asks us, how can we be prepared? When we take the initiative to go ask, how can we know that we're prepared? It's not easy. (laughs) However, it's not all up to us, is it? You see, the Ethiopian eunuch, when he asked, how can I understand unless someone guides me? It, it, like I mentioned before, like a cry for help almost. It resonates, I think, of Acts 16 when the Philippian jailer said, what must I do to be saved? And then Paul and Silas preach to him and say, believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved. And then he eventually is baptized, him and his family. But the jailer. So then if we look at the Ethiopian eunuch, right after he asks, who is the author speaking about? Philip then, in road to Emmaus fashion, preaches Jesus to him. Right? He preaches Jesus. And after that, on the way, they pass some water, and the the eunuch's like, hey, I mean, there's some water here. What's preventing me from being baptized? A cry for help. They were preached Jesus, and it ended in baptism. So we see that Philip was prepared to give an answer. He was prepared for this moment. But what led him there? What made him prepared? How can we replicate that experience? Well, first we must look at the one who gives us life. How does God handle these? Well, we see that God initiates the answers to questions that we have. If you look in verse 26, before any questions, before any baptism, before any preaching of Jesus, God says to Philip, go to the road from Jerusalem leading down to Gaza. He tells him to go. 
So what does Philip do? He goes, right? He goes. And this may seem like a minor detail, like, oh, of course the Bible character is going to go, right? That's what always happens. But tell me this, could Philip have answered his question if he had not first surrendered to God's direction? Surrender comes first. This is how. This is the first step in being prepared to give an answer. Look at Abraham. Genesis chapter 12. God says to him, go from the land which you live into a land I will show you so that the nations may be blessed. In Exodus 3, God tells Moses at the burning bush, go so that your people may be freed. We see God taking the initiative here. And then Moses is like, I don't, I don't, I stutter. I stutter a little bit sometimes, so if I do, bear with me, but I relate to that on a spiritual level. And he says, I stutter, so I, you know, I would not want to go speak in front of, you know, the president or whatever with a stuttering problem. I, I, I would not sign up for that either. But then God says, I will give you the words to say, but first you must go. You must surrender. And, you know, that sounds nice in theory, but then the other question is, how am I to answer the question, though, still? Like, once I'm there, and I do go, how do I answer the question? <laughs> We're going to get to that in a second. But surrender comes first. You see, to give an answer, I think it's more of an offensive move instead of a defensive one. It's us taking the initiative instead of being backed into the corner and trying to practice apologetics. No. It's chasing after our world. Look at the second command that God gave to Philip. Go and run and take over his chariot. Join him where he is. Catch up to him. Join him. Seek after him. It's an offensive move, a move of confidence that carries authority. You see, God could answer all the questions on his own. He can do that, right? I mean, because God exists, people have the ability to have questions. So I'm pretty sure he could answer them, but he wants our cooperation in this because he knows the power of human testimony. Jesus himself did this. In Luke chapter 15, Jesus describes himself as the shepherd who goes after the lost sheep. He goes. He goes after it. In John chapter 1, 14, John chapter 1, verse 14, the word became flesh and dwelt among us. So we see God coming down from his heavenly throne to be with us. And then John 3, 16. For God so loved the world that he did what? He sent his one and only son. We see initiative happening here. Taking charge. The world is looking for answers. Go give them one. This is the call. And then, I mean, we have the Great Commission. <laughs> Go. Make disciples of all nations. Baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit. You guys know how it goes. So we see this, this, this ordained command to go. To respond to his call. But then there's another part of it. What if I don't hear his voice? Sure, it would be easy to follow God if he spoke to me as clearly as he did to Philip. How can I know where I'm supposed to go? How can I know 
what I am supposed to do. How can I be prepared to give an answer if I don't even hear his voice? Questions that oftentimes come with that is, well, maybe, maybe it's because I'm not eloquent enough to give an answer. I'm not smart enough to give an answer. Maybe I haven't been as close to Jesus lately as I should. Maybe I'm not worthy to go do this. Maybe I'm not good enough to go do this. Maybe God doesn't want to use me. Maybe there are others who are fit for the work of apologetics, but maybe it's not me. Maybe my testimony isn't powerful enough. Maybe I'm not good enough. Maybe that's why I don't hear his voice. So what are we to do at that point? Well, let's look at the Sermon on the Mount. In Matthew chapter six, chapter, yeah, chapter six, chapter five, chapter seven, all three. In the beginning in chapter five, right after the Beatitudes, Jesus looks at a group of spiritually malnourished people and without any titles being known, without any education being known, he says to them, you are the light of the world. A city that is set on a hill cannot be hidden. Likewise, does no one light a lamp and put it under a basket, but instead they put it on a lampstand and it gives light to the entire house. In this manner, let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father in heaven. So in a sense, it's not even what we do, it is who we are, who God has called us to be. So that's one part of it. So we know, okay, if God can say it to them, he can say it to me, but that still doesn't answer the question, where am I supposed to go? What am I supposed to say? How can I be prepared to give an answer? Well, in Isaiah chapter 55, verse 11, if you guys want to turn there, you don't have to. <laughs> we see that God makes a promise concerning this. You see, in my circle of influence, right, in your circle of influence, there are people searching for answers, right? They may not express it explicitly, but they have them. And sometimes the paralysis of I don't hear God's voice, sometimes we just need to push through and just do it anyways. Reach them anyways. Even if I don't feel it. You just gotta go do it. And then it will become normal. It will become part of who you are as being the light of the world. In Isaiah chapter 55, verse 11, Jesus says, my word will go out from me and it will not return to me void. It will not be in vain. People will be reached because of that first step that you take. It will not be in vain. So how can we be prepared to give an answer? Well, surrender comes first. <laughs> you see, when I was younger, and I guess still now, when I was younger, um, growing up at home, uh, like I mentioned, I lived in California. This isn't really a necessary detail, but I'm proud of it, so. <laughs> Uh, we had seven acres, and we had a lot of land and stuff, and so being the young strapping boy that I was at age 10, my dad was like, we need to get him out working, <laughs> um, a tradition I will probably carry on when I have kids as well. <laughs> Anyways, the ripe age of 10, my dad's like, you need to come help me build this rock retaining wall or whatever. You need to come help me build this fence. You need to come help me mow the lawn. Now, was I qualified to do that? Was I the sharpest tool in the shed? No. Was I the most fit man for the job? No, I thought I was, but I wasn't. So why did he ask me to help him? Why did he ask me to take part in his work? For no other reason but that I am his son. That 
is enough for him. Because I am his son. Join me, God is saying. Even if you don't feel it. You know, I didn't always feel like doing yard work. <laughs> My dad said he started to like it when he got older for reasons I don't know. But I can kind of see where he's coming from now. But anyways, you know, even if I didn't feel like it, whenever I went and did it, I left with the satisfaction knowing it was the right thing to do. Whether or not I felt it, I cannot wait to feel good. I must go out and do. And he says, my word will not return to me vain. It will not return to me void. Even the smallest step means something in the race we are to run. In Matthew chapter 20, Jesus tells a parable. And this is where we get the parable of, you know, some worked for 12 hours, some worked for two hours, and they got paid the same. This is this parable, right? We're not even actually really gonna look at that one, but we're not, we're not gonna look at that part of the story, but before, it says that the landowner went to the marketplace. So why did he do this? Well, back in antiquity, it was common where if you didn't have a job, you would go and stand in the marketplace and wait for someone to hire you for the day. It's like, posting your resume on LinkedIn or something and just waiting, right? So they would go and just stand there and wait, and he would be, hey, I need your help. No, get over here. <laughs> I'll pay you a day's wages. It doesn't say the landowner went and interviewed them first, right? He just went and asked, are you willing? Do you want to follow me? If so, you can do the work that I've called you. You see, we cannot wait until we are able to surrender. But instead, when we surrender, we are made able. Exodus chapter three, I will give you the words to say, Moses. My word will not return to me void. And like a dad saying to his kid about to go mow the lawn, <laughs> even after he maybe didn't, didn't do it as well as his older brother. You know, maybe he, maybe he, hit, the, he hit the blade on a tree branch. <laughs> he said, I still ask you to do it again tomorrow because you are my son. And that's enough. And the more you do it, the better you will get. The more comfortable you will become. And then when you're older, you can teach your child to do the same. So there's this maturity that happens as we do this more. We suddenly become more inclined to then be able to teach others how to do the same but none of this would have happened. None of this could have been possible if surrender had not come first. Ellen White says the eunuch was gonna be used in a powerful work to reach his region. But tell me, would that have happened if Philip, when God said go, would have said no? <laughs> would that have happened? Mm -mm. Who is to say what we are hindering if we don't follow that call? But who's to say what will happen when we do? Surrender comes first. You see, there's a, there's a verse I really like in Romans chapter 10 that I think summarizes this 
quite well. This is what it says. Chapter 10, verse 12. It says, For there is no distinction between Jew and Greek. For the same Lord over all is rich to all who call upon him. For whoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. Moving on to verse 14. How then shall they call on him in whom they have not believed? And how shall they believe in him of whom they have not heard? And how shall they hear without a preacher? And how shall they preach unless they are sent? How beautiful are the feet of those who preach the gospel, who bring glad tidings of good things. This isn't just for a select group of people who God has deemed worthy. This is for everyone. Because you are my son, you are enough. You are able. I will give you the words to say. And as in part of surrendering, he may direct us to deeper prayer, to recognize his voice. He may direct us to deeper study of his words so than we have a few verses in our back pocket. He will direct us to growth in him. It is a process. It does not happen overnight, but surrender comes first no matter what. And then going back to Matthew 5. You are the light of the world. In this manner, let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father in heaven.